A depressed door-to-door -door saleswoman learns the unnerving truth about reality and has to make a tough decision between abandoning the only life she's ever known or living the solitary life she's always dreamed of. While listening to a calming guided meditation, Sarah, an anxious solar panel saleswoman, envisions herself standing in front of a tranquil lake. The soothing voice encourages her to embrace the inevitability of change as a means to overcome her worries. As the meditation closes, Sarah Sarah returns to the present moment, finding herself and her car parked in front of a potential customer's house. As soon as the playback ends, she casually tosses her phone aside and heads toward the house. However, upon reaching the doorstep, she hears the homeowners mistaking her for a Jehovah's Witness. After clarifying that she sells solar panels, the avoidant homeowners retreat to their garage and drive off, leaving Sarah in disbelief. Following this encounter, Sarah attends her therapy session with Dr. Theodore. The therapist compassionately reminds her to accept things beyond her control and shift her focus to what she can actually change. However, she sarcastically notes that worrying erases her existential dread. In response, Dr. Theodore points out her use of sarcasm during their sessions, but Sarah explains that it's challenging for her to think without worry. As the therapist suggests not to waste energy on inevitable things, Sarah shares her doubts about the future and her lack of motivation to invest in long-term endeavors, as she believes she won't live to see the age of 50. Interpreting her words, Dr. Theodore suggests that Sarah may be coming to terms with her mortality. Reflecting on this, Sarah admits that facing her own mortality is no longer as daunting as it once was. When Dr. Theodore asks if she ever hurt herself, Sarah explains that her greater worry lies in surviving a post-apocalyptic world, rather than confronting her own demise caused by an apocalypse. So Dr. Theodore suggests she focus on the real world and actively engage with people around her. When she dismisses the idea, he points out that people need people. Before leaving, Sarah says they haven't made any significant process in the last two years of therapy. Dr. Theodore acknowledges her sentiment and agrees, noting that they haven't reached a breakthrough yet. Later, Sarah engages in a workout session with her childhood best friend Kayla, who reminds the anxious millennial about her upcoming date on Friday night with her brother's cute entrepreneur friend. Despite Sarah's initial hesitation, Kayla encourages her to go on the date because she shouldn't let her frustration with losing her dream job cause her to be resentful towards the world. Eventually, Sarah agrees to the date, clarifying that she's doing it for Kayla's sake. At home, Sarah unexpectedly encounters her landlord, Barry, who reminds her that her rent is due. Later that night, Sarah finds herself deeply distressed, contemplating taking her own life as she holds a bottle of medication. However, she ultimately decides against it, placing the canister back in the cabinet. Sleep eludes her, and she remains awake throughout the night, consumed by her inner turmoil. Turmoil. Reluctantly, she rises when her alarm eventually rings, mustering the strength to go to work. Shortly after Sarah returns home from work, she receives a phone call from her mother. During the conversation, her mother suggests that she consider utilizing her expensive degree once again because she believes Sarah is capable of doing more. In a sarcastic tone, Sarah expresses her enjoyment of being underemployed and dismisses the need for reminders about her underachievements. As she mentions her upcoming date, her mother advises her to wear a cute outfit to make a favorable impression. Contrary to her mother's suggestion, Sarah chooses a casual outfit over a dress. That night, she arrives late at the pub, where she finally meets Tucker. During their dinner, Tucker boasts about his business accomplishments and extensive travels, while Sarah makes an effort to appear interested. However, when he suggests going to his place for the night, Sarah refuses, preferring to go home. However, Tucker misinterprets her statement, assuming that she is inviting him to spend the night at her place. Frustrated with his lack of understanding, Sarah asks him straightforwardly if he genuinely believes that their date went well. To Sarah's surprise, Tucker thinks that they had a good date, even pointing out that he considers himself a 9 and her a 6. Insulted by his demeaning comment, Sarah retaliates by questioning the societal impact of his business, suggesting that it doesn't truly contribute to the community as he claims. She further adds that he's an 8, not a 9, and bluntly advises him to overcome his inflated ego. Despite Sarah's strong remarks, Tucker stubbornly persists in his intention to go back to his place for the night. Angered, Sarah reaches her breaking point, exclaiming that she'd rather push him off a cliff than sleep with him. Once Sarah returns home, she gathers all her medication in the living room. In an attempt to take her life, she opens a pill bottle and pours all the capsules onto 
her hands, then ingesting them all at once. Suddenly, the television switches on by itself, presenting a host who reveals that Sarah's world is among a billion simulated realities created by future humans to understand all of the world's possible alternate histories. To further prove his point, the host mentions that the viewers are currently clutching a banana. Although Sarah initially dismisses the idea, she's taken aback when she sees a banana in her hand, causing her to drop the fruit. Then the host delivers the news that the simulated reality is rapidly approaching its expiration date in a week, which basically translates to the end of their world. The host adds that in accordance with the Simulated Consciousness Act of 3112, the people will receive a notification about the true nature of their existence before the simulated reality is ultimately terminated. They'll be presented with two choices, allowing them to make a decision regarding their fate after the discontinuation. Option A, an uncommon choice, permits an individual to opt to remain in the simulation without any external intervention. Meanwhile, option B, the more popular selection, involves transferring a person's consciousness to a simpler system that enables them to relive their five most cherished memories and bask in perpetual bliss. Before the announcement ends, the host informs that each person will get a personal guide who will assist them as they decide which option to take going forward. Before he finally says goodbye, he reveals that the guides will be arriving soon. True enough, Sarah's guide promptly knocks on her door after the broadcast ends. Upon opening the door for him, she suddenly throws up the capsule she took. Afterward, Sarah gets acquainted with her guide who discloses that although he resembles the TV host, he is actually an artificial intelligence program specifically tailored to her personality profile, designed to assist her throughout the discontinuation process. Skeptical of her guide, Sarah inquires about the number of times they've undergone the procedure, and he says that they've done it 114,225,700,604 times. Before Sarah dozes off, the guide assures her that he doesn't require sleep or food pledging to remain stationed at the table until she awakens. Reflecting on the effect of the discontinuation announcement, Sarah visits Dr. Theodore to express how she's been enlightened that nobody ever had any control over anything, implying that she's finally free from worrying. Inattentive to Sarah's words, Dr. Theodore appears preoccupied. The announcement has left him feeling inconvenienced by the revelation that the world was a fabrication. He clarifies that he values his own existence and cares about living, unlike Sarah, whom he believes to be better benefiting from the announcement. Upon learning of Sarah's uncertainty regarding her choice, Dr. Theodore, who is set on choosing option B, comments on how she always chooses to complicate things. He then rants about self-absorbed millennials who incessantly criticize boomers but still seek their therapy services without truly heeding their advice. Amidst the rant, Sarah maintains a smile, realizing the ironic shift in their positions. Before she leaves, Sarah jokes to meet again the following week, which further annoys him, as the world will have already met its and by then. Subsequently, Sarah and her guide head to a coffee shop, where she curiously asks him about the number of people who chose to stay. The guide responds, explaining that the percentage varies across different simulations, but generally it tends to be a small fraction of the total population. Then, Sarah contemplates how option A would provide her with the opportunity to finally be alone. Fascinated by the idea, Sarah asks the guide if he's encountered other versions of herself. However, he refuses to answer, stressing that his job is to assist her to decision-making process and not influence it with excess bias, which only reinforces Sarah's suspicion regarding the existence of her other versions. Later, Sarah spots Kayla, who seems to have embarked on a spiritual journey following the revelation of the discontinuation. Sarah finds her best friend engaging in a spiritual dance accompanied by her friend Otto, both donning red jumpsuits. Upon Sarah's approach, Kayla warmly greets her and then vocally worships the creators, whom she believes to be responsible for all creation. Despite Kayla's invitation, Sarah politely declines to join her in worship. Later, she discloses to Kayla that her guide serves as her direct connection to the creators. Upon returning home, Sarah expresses her confusion about how people are reacting to the discontinuation. Sarah then confesses that she'd prefer a world without other people. However, her guide counters that living in isolation is difficult, but she responds that dealing with other people is a problem for her. Upon checking her phone, Sarah realizes that she has missed calls from her mother and promptly calls her back. During the conversation, 
conversation, Sarah receives an invitation for a lunch date, which she immediately accepts. As Sarah and her guide arrive at her parents' house, she's shocked to find her dad Gary opening the door for her in his birthday suit, reasoning that he realized the pointlessness of clothing upon receiving the news. Startled by the sight, Sarah quickly averts her gaze. Her mother, Sharon, comes to the rescue and hands her dad some clothes, allowing him to cover up. Sharon then warmly welcomes Sarah inside. In the kitchen, Sharon begins to pour wine for Sarah, but Sarah promptly interrupts her, explaining that she no longer drinks. During lunch, Sharon inquires about her daughter's dating life but the daughter wants to change the subject. Suddenly, the two are surprised when Gary commands someone to be quiet. It turns out that Gary locked up his own guide in the basement because he claims the program wouldn't stop talking. Upon learning this, Sarah reminds his dad that he can send his guide away right after he makes a decision. But Gary doesn't want his guide to know what he's thinking. Meanwhile, Sharon shares that her guide is nice and very handsome. After Gary implies that they'll be taking option B, Sarah reveals that she's planning to stay. However, Gary laughs and questions how she's gonna make it without being taken care of by somebody, given what happened to her life. Insulted, Sarah walks out and drinks wine on the back porch, prompting Sharon to reprimand Gary for his insensitive behavior towards their daughter. She then orders her husband to apologize to Sarah, so Gary offers a sincere apology to Sarah and engages in a serious conversation about her decision to stay, to which she defends that she can live in the world the way she's always wanted because no one will dictate what she has to do. Concerned, Gary advises his daughter to ask her guy about the reason why their simulated reality is ending, so that she can consider all the facts before finalizing her decision. He explains that the world she chooses to stay in is defective, and he doesn't want her to be stuck in it when everything falls apart. As Sarah prepares to depart from her parents' house, she expresses her desire to spend more time with them in the remaining days. However, her parents reveal that they've decided to live their final days in Fiji, making today their final moment as a family. Sarah shares one last hug with her parents who tell her how proud of her they are and wish her luck. In the car, Sarah asks her guide why their simulation is ending, and he answers that they're reallocating resources to other simulations. He explains that every simulation is designed to test a specific variable impact on the world. In Sarah's world, the variable is a penguin, and their extinction led to the decision to discontinue the simulation. Reflecting on the guide's words, Sarah comes to the realization that humans are to blame for the extinction of penguins. Therefore, humans cause the end of the world, a conclusion that the guide confirms. This realization leads Sarah to think that everything is just as pointless as before. Enraged, Sarah requests her guide to step out of the car and assertively decides not to stay. However, the guide mentions that he'll keep an eye on her and know if she ever changes her mind. As Sarah parks outside her apartment, she screams in her car out of frustration, catching Barry's attention. He then gives her a flyer for an end-of-the-world party on Friday at midnight. Shortly after entering her apartment, she suffers a panic attack because of everything she learned that day. The next morning, Sarah leaves a voicemail for her parents and expresses her regret of not joining them and worries about what she'll do with herself. Afterward, Sarah blasts rock music and drinks on her own while she makes a mess of her room. Shortly after, she goes outside and catches Barry lying on the grass and looking up at the sky for the last time. He appears to have become nihilistic and presents the idea that everyone will all end up in the same place. Later, Sarah re-enters her apartment and sends a voice mail to Kayla, inviting her to go to the end of the world party with her. Then she wears a red dress to the party, where she encounters the egoistic Tucker, who insists on spending time with her. After walking out on Tucker, Sarah approaches Kayla, but her best friend ignores her because she's busy with her spiritual dance, causing Sarah to feel isolated. When Barry gathers everyone for the last minute countdown, Sarah joins the crowd and then closes her eyes as their simulated world finally approaches termination, with her ultimately deciding to stay and live a peaceful life. Two years later, Sarah finds herself in a peaceful state, relishing the freedom of solitude. She spends her time leisurely exploring the world, embarking on hikes, bike rides, and scavenging for supplies. With no one to encounter along her journeys, Sarah enjoys the tranquility and independence that her chosen path affords her. Unexpectedly, as Sarah picks fruits, she's startled to hear Tucker's voice from behind her. To her surprise, Tucker reveals that he too opted to stay in the simulated reality, explaining that he prefers to live in the present rather than relive the past, which Sarah thinks is a good answer. Despite Tucker's persistent request to hang out and his promise to find her, Sarah bids him goodbye in annoyance. She hops on her bike and rides off. As she arrives at her apartment, she screams in frustration, 
because her desire to be entirely alone in the world has been shattered. The following morning, as Sarah embarks on her bike ride, she is taken by surprise when she spots Tucker riding on his bike, fulfilling his earlier promise. Intrigued, he follows her as she makes her way to the stream. As Sarah collects fresh water, Tucker expresses how lonely he's been with his choice to stay, given he's an extrovert. He wishes he could have gone for option B just like everyone else, prompting the sarcastic Sarah to support it. When Tucker calls her out for such a response, Sarah explains that it's her payback for his rude behavior, and then later exclaims how his existence reminds her of the life she hated. Tucker defends that after spending time by himself, he admits how toxic he was, and how he treated people like trash. He then calls out Sarah for still being as judgmental and selfish as she was before, prompting her to walk out on him. As Tucker chases after Sarah, determined to assist her and carry one of her water jugs, she forcefully pushes him away, causing Tucker to lose his balance and accidentally plummet off the cliff to his demise, mirroring Sarah's remark from their first date. Overwhelmed by the gruesome sight, Sarah cautiously glances at Tucker, but quickly retreats, unable to bear what she'd done. Consumed by guilt and remorse for her actions, she breaks down in tears. From that point forward, whenever she goes to collect fresh water, she's haunted by what she'd done. Days later, Sarah hears a knock on her door, prompting her to grab a sharp tool just in case. When she opens the door, she's surprised to see the guide. She then hugs him in relief and breaks down in tears. The guide reveals that he's been closely monitoring Sarah and says that there are 246,922 other people who chose to stay. Sarah explains that she felt more alive when she was alone for two years, but after Tucker's demise, she realized that she actually cared about other people. The guide reassures Sarah that Tucker is where everyone else is now, to her relief. When the guide brings up her final decision to stay, Sarah stands by it, claiming it's her responsibility to live with the consequences. Upon hearing Sarah's response, the guide proposes an alternative, offering to transport her to where everyone else is. He explains that many individuals who initially chose to stay will eventually choose to go, and they simply let them come to the decision on their own time. Sarah breaks down and realizes that she judged people for choosing option B because it's the easiest way out, but she couldn't do it herself. The guide comforts her, explaining that everyone's struggles are different. Eventually, Sarah agrees to go where everyone else is, but requests to enjoy the rest of the day to herself, which the guide approves, saying he'll see her the next morning. Before leaving, the guide finally reveals that he's met 321,000 versions of Sarah. He explains that he didn't reveal this before because not all of her versions chose to stay, and that he didn't want that to taint her decision. He adds that most of the Sarahs were quick to take their own life, and never found out about the simulated reality. Out of all the Sarahs, she is the one that made it the farthest, which makes her the strongest and truest version of herself. Following a heartfelt moment with her guide, Sarah swiftly prepares her belongings and embarks on a bicycle journey towards a tranquil lake. Once there, she delicately retrieves a bottle of pills from her bag, blissfully gazes into the distance, and basks in the sunlight. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.